Well, hello and welcome to what we're calling Westgate at Home. No matter where you're watching from, we are so happy that you've chosen to join us for the next 40 minutes. Our desire is to see as many people connecting as possible. So if you've been impacted by your experience today, why not take a moment to share the link on whatever, whatever platform you're watching from right now and this will help spread the news about this amazing faith community and invite others to be a part of it. We just want to grow and share the good news with others. Everything we do here at Westgate Christian Church is because of your generosity. Why not consider becoming one of our giving partners? To do this, the easiest way is to simply go to our website at mywestgatechurch.com, just click on the giving tab at the top of the screen and follow the prompts there and you can set yourself up for a one-time gift or set yourself up for ongoing giving. By doing this, we can partner together to truly make an impact on the world. Today, I wanna to encourage you to do two things, connect with God and connect with others. I mean, why not spend some time getting to know a God who loves you, who listens to you, and who wants to lead you in your life? And then connect to others. We need each other. I mean, we need to be supportive and encouraging to one another. And as we draw nearer to Christmas time, I want to invite you to connect maybe a couple more times this month, even more if you can. We've set up different ways that you can do that. By engaging in Westgate at home, just like you're doing right now and with people in your home, or maybe you might want to consider inviting a few friends over and holding a watch party together and sharing that experience. We also, for the next couple weeks, we're holding watch parties at the church campus there at Westgate. So it's good to see all of you there at Westgate as well. The third way is to get involved in a life group. And the best way to do that is to, to find a list of life groups we have on the website. Well, you might be asking, what's my next step? The best way to figure that out is to go to the website and, and just fill out the contact form there on the, the homepage and I'll be sure to contact you about that and we'll have a good conversation. So, with that being said, the moment you've been waiting for is here. Our experience is about to begin and it all starts right now.
like sweet, sweet honey on my lips. Like the sound of a symphony to my ears. Like holy water on my skin. Dead men walking, slave to sin. talk to you about how to keep your faith in turbulent times. What does it take to keep our faith in the, in the face of rejection or criticism or even persecution? Jesus says in Matthew 5, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And the statement's so shocking, he actually repeats it again in the next verse. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. He's saying, blessed are those who can handle rejection. Blessed are those whose beliefs are so strong that they can, they can withstand any attack. Paul says it like this in 2 Timothy 3. In fact, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Notice it doesn't say he might be, he will be. Now, if you live a godly life, then you will face opposition. If you're a student and you declare you're a virgin, you're not going to have sex till you're married. See what, see what other kids will say about that. See if they don't laugh at you. Or if you're a business person and say, I'm not going to do everything it takes to climb the corporate ladder because I love God and I want to, I want to please God first and foremost. See what the world says about that. The fact is, the world can't stand anyone who's different. Guess what? Jesus didn't fit the mold. He didn't do what the Pharisees wanted him to do. He wouldn't compromise. He wouldn't conform. They had to either follow him or kill him. So they killed him. Jesus said that all who live godly will be persecuted, that they'll have their faith tested. So if you have your Bible um, turn to the book of Daniel in the Old Testament. In fact, Daniel 3. 
I want to share a story about three young men from the land of Judah who kept strong in their faith to God through incredible diversity and who, like Jesus, were persecuted to the point of death. These were three young men of great promise. They had risen to high positions in the world's most powerful nation. They could look forward to great families and deeply fulfilling lives, doing amazing things for their people and for their God. Their hearts were full of hopes and dreams. So here's the setting. King Nebuchadnezzar, the great king of Babylon, he's made this giant 90 foot tall image of gold. And he says, when the music starts to play, I want everyone in the kingdom to bow down to this image that I've set up. If you don't bow down to my image, then I'm going to throw you into a fiery furnace and you're going to die. So the music starts to play and everyone bows down to the king's image, except for these three young men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, the king thought of himself as a fair and just king, and he gave them the benefit of the doubt. And he says, hey, look, boys, I understand that you didn't bow down to my image, so I'm going to give you another chance. Hey, either you bow down to my idol or I'm going to kill you. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are faced with a life or death decision. Either they, they bow down to this false god and live knowing they had broken their promise to the one true God, or they die. All they had to do was say the word. All they had to do was bend their knee. Their nightmare would be over. They would live to gain positions of power and honor and status, or they could enter into a world of unimaginable pain and eventual death. One word would mean life or death to them, but they wouldn't say it. They wouldn't mold. They wouldn't conform. They wouldn't compromise. They had to either follow this king or be killed, life or death. And they chose, well, they chose death. That kind of devotion to God really is possible for ordinary people like you and me. Look at verse 17. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego said, If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he doesn't, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was furious with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and his attitude toward them changed. He ordered the furnace heated seven times hotter than usual. Literally, that could be translated, and the, the expression on his face changed. You see, when, when they were first brought down to the king for not bowing down to the idol, Nebuchadnezzar was mad. But in the face of their unshakable devotion to face death rather than disobey God, Nebuchadnezzar, he totally loses it. His attitude toward them changed. The scripture says he ordered that the furnace be heated seven times hotter than usual. Now, that number seven was often used in the ancient world as a metaphorical way of saying a lot. For instance, in the book of Proverbs, it says, though a righteous man falls seven times, he rises again. Or a fool thinks he is wiser than seven men who answer with discretion. Basically, Nebuchadnezzar is saying, I want you to crank the furnace up as hot as you can. Now, I want you to think right now of what these three guys are facing. Have you ever been burned? Maybe with just a match or a hot stove? It hurts. When I was in high school, I worked at a Wendy's restaurant. Guys, I made a whopping $3.35 an hour. I was, I was filthy rich, yeah. One of my jobs working there was to clean the deep fryer. It was basically this big metal pressure cooker filled with boiling hot oil. Every day, an employee of Wendy's was to take a hamburger spatula and thoroughly scrape the sides of the fryer, letting the crispy stuff spill into the hot oil and then remove whatever we could with a little strainer. Well, it was my job. I was scraping the spatula, you know, and, and the spatula just slipped right into the hot oil. And, and the oil went right up to my wrist. It just burned my hand. You know, when I pulled my hand out of the oil, several layers of skin melted off and into the fryer. That's beautiful. I'm sure it made a nice addition to someone's chicken sandwich later that day, but I digress. As I'm staring in shock at my still burning hand, the girl standing next to me started to scream and she rushed me to the nearest water faucet and let the water, you know, just kind of spill over my burn. 
Then they called my parents. They sent me to the emergency room. And after a while, the numbness wears off and the seething pain starts to kick in. In addition to the physical pain that occur when you get burned, you have to understand that to burn someone to death is historically one of the most inhumane forms of execution. It involves treating a human being like an object, like a, like a piece of trash ready to be tossed aside. So there won't even be a, a corpse left to mourn. It's usually done to witches, heretics, people that society just want to dispose of and forget. That's what th these three guys are facing. And they face it voluntarily knowing that at any moment, at any time, with one word, it could save their lives. Verse 21. So these men, wearing the robes, trousers, turbans, and other clothes, were bound and thrown into the blazing furnace. The king's command was so urgent and the furnace so hot that the flames of the fire killed the soldiers who took up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And these three men, firmly tied, fell into the blazing furnace. These men are so firmly bound, they have to be carried into the furnace. And the furnace is so hot that the men who carried them up there, they die. The writer wants us to understand that Nebuchadnezzar's rage is so intense, he's killed his own men and it doesn't even register with him. This isn't a story of some people who are running away from a weekend campfire. There is no hope, humanly speaking. Immobilized, tied up bodies, they're being tossed into a raging inferno. That's the setting. Now I want to stop for a moment and ask you to try as best you can to imagine the experiences of these three young men on what seemed to be their last moments of life. These guys have been faithful to the very end. Since the first time they heard about the terrible idea of bowing down before this image of gold, they knew that the end was coming. And every exit, every door has been closed to them. Yet they, they remain faithful to the very last. And they're carried now to the furnace. These are real people filled with courage, maybe some fear, some defiance, some faith. And they feel the heat. They've seen the men that carried them to the furnace collapse and die right before their eyes. And then all of a sudden, there they are in the fire. So now they wait for the, the searing pain, for, for the numbness, for the smoke inhalation to suffocate their lungs. But it doesn't happen. In fact, they don't even feel any different. They don't even feel warm. There's no smoke choking them. There's no burns. You know what? Their, their hands aren't even tied up anymore. They're walking around in that furnace, and that's not even the best part. Verse 24. Then King Nebuchadnezzar leapt to his feet in amazement and asked his advisors, Weren't there three men that we tied up and threw into the fire? They replied, Certainly, Your Majesty. He said, Look, I, I see four men walking around in the fire, unbound and unharmed, and the fourth looks like a son of the gods. So there's a fourth member of the furnace club. Apparently he's unharmed. Apparently he's the one who delivered the other three. And he has this little meeting right there in the furnace. Who was this fourth man who came out of nowhere, seemingly cheating death and looks in appearance like the son of the gods? Well, the text doesn't say, but I'm going to give it an educated wild guess and say it was Jesus. Why? Because it sounds like something he would do. And they're walking around together in the furnace. Apparently, those guys, they spent a little bit of time together down there. And they had the world's greatest life group meeting right there in the furnace. <laughs> I wonder what they said to one another. You know, I, I wonder what, what that fourth man said. I wonder if he said to the other three, you know what, guys? God is so proud of you. He's so proud of your faithfulness. He, he is so pleased with your endurance. I wonder if he told them that, that because of their act of faithfulness, their names would be remembered for centuries to come. See, we still remember their crazy names today, right? I wonder what, what they said to that fourth man. I bet they poured out adoration and wonder and and, and thanksgiving and worship like they never had in their lives. It's a funny thing. They came into that situation thinking they had to withhold worship from a false God, and they end up worshiping like they never had in their lives. Worship is like that. And the furnace, which 
which looked like the end of their lives, it turns out to be the greatest thing they've ever experienced. The furnace turns out to be the place where they actually meet God. Here's the whole point of the story. Sometimes God delivers people from the furnace, but sometimes God delivers people in the furnace. Let me say that again. Sometimes God delivers people from the furnace, and sometimes... Sometimes he delivers people in the furnace. Jesus said to them what he says to people still, I'll meet you in the furnace. The place where full devotion can lead you, that looks scary, the place that looks dangerous and painful, even if it looks like it could be the end of your life, it turns out to be where Jesus is. It turns out to be the safest place of your life. It turns out to be the adventure of your life. And Jesus says to people still, I'll meet you in the furnace. You follow me. It's going to look dark. It's going to look scary. It's going to look dangerous. But keep following me. I'll meet you in the furnace. He says it still. He's saying it to some of you right now. Verse 26. Nebuchadnezzar then approached the opening of the blazing furnace and shouted, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, servants of the Most High God, come out, come here. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego came out of the fire, and the satraps, prefects, governors, and royal advisors crowded around them. They saw that the fire had not burned their bodies, nor was a hair on their head singed. Their robes weren't scorched, and there was no smell of fire on them. The writer says that their robes weren't even scorched. Remember back in verse 21, we saw that the writer goes into a little bit of detail about the clothes they wore, the robes, the, the trousers, the turbans, and so on. Why does he say that? Because he has an eye for fashion? <laughs> no. The writer wants us to understand the extent of this miracle God's performed. Not only did he save these men's lives, he protected their hair. He even saved their clothes. Verse 28. Then Nebuchadnezzar said, Praise be to the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who has sent his angel and rescued his servants. And they trusted in him and defied the king's command and were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any god except their own god. Now, wait a minute. Who is this guy? Is this the same guy that killed his own man and that fact didn't even register with him? Now he's praising you know, these three young men for, for doing the right thing and, and actually uh, the audacity to defy his commands. This is the same guy. Something has really changed in this guy's heart. They trusted in him and defied the king's command. The king says, and they were willing to give up their lives rather than serve or worship any God except their own God. Therefore, I decree that the people of any nation or language who say anything against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be cut into pieces and their houses be burned into piles of rubble. There he is. Not a big freedom of worship guy. He says, for no other God can save in this way. Verse 30. Then the king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. The king doesn't just restore them, he lifts them up to new positions with more opportunities to serve, more influence, more, more ways to contribute. And going into the furnace, which looked like the last thing they wanted to do, it turns out to be the greatest event of their lives. And ironically enough, the furnace, which looked like death, it turns out to be the safest place of all. Why? Because God is there. Because sometimes God delivers people from the furnace, and sometimes, friends, sometimes God delivers people in the furnace. And I think those times are the greatest times in our lives. There's a location in the world described as the 1040 window. Its location is 10 degrees to 40 degrees north of the equator, and it includes Africa, the Middle East, and Central Asia. Two-thirds of the world's population live in the 1040, roughly 4.4 billion people. The reality is that the, the Christians in the 1040 window are having their faith tested every day. They're terribly persecuted. They're intimidated. They're raped. They're harassed. They're tortured, pressured to renounce their faith. They're discriminated against. They're denied health care. 
jobs, education. They're starved, even murdered for worshiping God. More Christians were killed for their faith in the 20th century than all the other centuries previous combined. And yet through all of this persecution, the churches in the 1040 window are flourishing. They're growing 300 to 400% faster and larger than any church in the United States. Why is that? Because God's in the furnace. And I mention this because I think there's a great danger for us as Christians living in this nation of ours. It's a comfortable place to live, I admit. The United States is a great nation. But the danger for us is that the primary goal of our lives isn't about being persecuted to the point of death. The danger for us is that the primary focus for our lives becomes avoiding the furnace. It's when I pray, God, deliver me from pain. Deliver me from discomfort or suffering or inconvenience. Make my life smooth and easy and comfortable and pleasant. God, would you, would you remove obstacles from my life? See, we avoid even low-level flames. Even Paul did that. In his second letter to the Corinthian church, Paul says, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me, but he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. See, God says to Paul, Hey, I'll meet you in the furnace. And if you know anything about Paul in his life, you know that he was in the furnace a lot. Why? Because God was there. I want to ask you to consider to do something that could be quite dangerous today. No one can force you or, or manipulate you to, to do this. Okay? But I want to ask you to consider this. Stop asking for less heat if that's what you've been asking for. That you don't ask for an easier or a richer or more pleasant or more secure life. Because I think that there's something way better. I want to ask you to consider to pray a dangerous prayer, maybe something like this. God, give me an opportunity to show my devotion to you. I may not primarily ask for security or ease or comfort or success, but let me show my complete devotion to you. If I'm persecuted in your name, let me be harassed in your name. You know, let me show my devotion to you, God. And if you're not sure, if you feel like your devotion level isn't where it should be, talk to him about it. Be really honest to God about it. Ask for the presence of the fourth man. Maybe you need to stop praying for deliverance from the furnace and start asking for the presence of the God who meets you there. See, my friends, I, I don't know. I, I just know that the golden statue in our world tends to involve gods with names like comfort and ease and security and success. And somewhere along the line, too many people in too many churches have gotten the idea that following Christ had something to do with an easier life. So I'm going to put it to you in the form of a question. Where did Jesus say to his followers, you know what, guys, God has a wonderful plan for your life. And it mainly involves a great house, an attractive spouse, a wonderful car, a great big TV, a terrific job, and an endless succession of easy, comfortable days. Where does Jesus say that? Actually, what, what Jesus said to people was, follow me, and you're going to have a great big God working behind you. You're going to have a tremendous joy right there in front of you, and you're going to be in trouble all the time. You see, people followed him. They followed him by the hundreds and thousands and, and by the tens of thousands. Throughout history, thousands of ordinary men and women like you and me, most of them long since forgotten, names and faces that'll never be remembered in this world said, Lord, I will follow you. I will go to the furnace. I will do anything for you, Lord. I'll even die for you. Let me tell you, God didn't forget them. He didn't overlook them or abandon them. God said to them what he said to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, what he said to, to Stephen, who was the very first follower of Christ to be martyred, what he said to Peter, and what he said to Paul, who were both beaten and, and persecuted and jailed, 
what he said to Corey Ten Boom, a Christian Holocaust survivor who helped so many Jews escape the Nazis during World War II, what he said to Martin Luther King Jr., what he said to Mother Teresa in the streets of Calcutta, India, and maybe what he said to some of you here today, I'll meet you in the furnace. Now, I don't know what your furnace looks like. I don't know what you're facing. I don't know what that means for you. I just know who will meet you there. And Jesus says, fear not, though you pass through the flames, they will not burn you, they will not destroy you. He says, I'll meet you in the furnace. So we're gonna go now to a time of communion and I want to end with a word about Jesus and the furnace that he faced. So if you have your communion emblems, just get, get those ready right now. Get that bread and juice ready. There was, there was a time toward the end of, of Jesus' life where he was so distraught and so alone, he experienced his own kind of furnace. He said to his disciples, <clears throat> my soul is overwhelmed with, with sorrow to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. And of course they don't. They all fall asleep. Jesus is all alone. Jesus continues to pray, my father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. And he talks about the cup, which is his furnace. In the book of Luke, it says, he was praying very fervently and his sweat became like drops of blood falling down upon the ground. See, Jesus knew about his betrayal before it ever happened. He knew he was gonna suffer public ridicule. He, he was gonna face a savage Roman beating. He knew the cross would ultimately kill his body. He knew he was gonna die. But as, as awful as those things were for Jesus to experience, as much as he would rather those things not happen, the cup he wanted to, to have pass was something different than public ridicule and physical pain or even death. Jesus furnace what agonized him to the point of his body sweating like drops of blood was the fact that was for the first time since the beginning of time, he would be separated from the Father. Jesus, the Lamb of God, took on his shoulders all the world's sins, all your sin, all mine. He became sin. He paid the price for our sin so we didn't have to. And he says, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me at that moment? he and his father were separated. So we take this piece of bread, and this is symbolic of Jesus' perfect body that was broken for you and for me. And he said to his disciples, as he says to us in the scripture, as you take this, eat this and remember me. And so let's take and eat. This cup of juice is symbolic of the blood of Christ. And Jesus talked to his disciples and said, this is the blood of the covenant which is poured out for you. As you drink this, remember me. Let's drink. Let's pray together. Father God, these words come to mind. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. Father, thank you for giving us your ultimate gift of love for Jesus. Thank you for, for the fact that he actually faced his furnace. And Lord, he did it. He did it all by himself. He was all alone so that we didn't have to do that. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty who was and is and is to come. God, we want to meet you in the furnace. We want to meet you there. As scary as that can be, Lord, we want to follow you and be directed by you and guided by you each day of our lives. And we want to meet you there. And we thank you for this time. It's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody says together, amen.
deep, way down deep, way down deep, down in my 